So glad you guys are here. This is wonderful. Love to see so many of you here just to learn about ADR, dispute resolution at USC Gold. So this is great. Um, my name is Amanda Thiden, and I am one of our career and academic advisors here. Um, I'm only going to be joining you very quickly for the start um, to introduce you to our host for today. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce all of you to Professor Richard Peterson. Richard is an esteemed attorney, highly experienced mediator, and highly sought after professor in our dispute resolutions programs. He teaches various courses in mediation and dispute resolution for our master's in dispute resolution, our LLM in ADR, and our ADR certificate program, and he leads our practical mediation skills clinic. So previously at USC Gold, he served as a lecturer in law and senior director for experiential education. But before coming to USC, he was on the faculty of the Pepperdine University School of Law, where he served for 15 years, including as a member of the faculty at the Strauss Institute for Dispute Resolution. So while at Pepperdine, he also served as the director of the Special Education Advocacy Clinic director of externships, and he holds a Bachelor of Studies in Law and a GD from Western State University, as well as an MDR and an LLM from Pepperdine. So he has served as chair of the Disability Law Section and the Law Mental Health Disability Section of the, American, um, of the Association of American Law Schools as well as a member of the board of directors of a number of nonprofit organizations, including Regional Center of Orange County, Down Syndrome Association of Orange County, and as a member of the professional advisory board of the Epilepsy Alliance of Orange County. So his scholarly publications also include articles um, on the topic of therapeutic justice and therapeutic juris jurisprudence. So before beginning his teaching career in 2002, he worked as a consultant to school districts and schools across the nation, teaching dispute resolution and anger management curriculum to K-12 teachers, administrators, and probation officers as a part of a gang violence prevention program. Um, he began practicing law in 1979 and has served as a private mediator and arbitrator for more than 35 years. And then for those who are uh, who know what this is, he also has an AV rating with Martindale Hubble. So after all of that, again, I just wanna welcome Professor Richard Peterson. I think we're all really looking forward to hearing you speak today. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to you and um, look forward to, to hearing what we're all gonna learn today. Great, thank you very much. Um, let me see if I can get this. We've, we have a very large group today. Um, and one of the great things about uh, dispute resolution education is that it's very interactive. So we have a much larger group than we would generally have in a class. And uh, what I'm going to do today is give you kind of a sample of one of our negotiation uh, classes and typical of, of ADR education in and of itself. And as Amanda said, I've been a professor for more than 20 years and I practiced law as a trial attorney for 20 some odd years before that. And one of the things that I learned very early in the 1990s when I decided to go back to school for dispute resolution uh, education was that uh, through my trial work, I found that there that it, it was rewarding financially, but from the user perspective of clients, there seemed like there should be a better way to resolve conflict with greater participant satisfaction. I've tried many cases before juries, judges, arbitrators, and even in those cases where we were very uh, 
successful and won, not once did I ever have a client say, man, that was fun. When can we do this again? You know, most people going through litigation felt like they'd been uh, dragged through a knothole backwards. And so I was convinced that there would be a better way to do it. And I remember sitting in this uh, great big hall, getting ready for classes to start. And I'd been away from uh, any kind of uh, schooling for more than 20 years. And I sat in a law school and the director of the program came up, introduced everybody. We were going to get started on an intensive week uh, program. And he said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall become the children of God. Have a great week. And I tell you that Hare stood up what Hare I had back then, um, because here I was in a law school hearing about being a peacemaker. Uh, and uh, I will tell you that I learned from that moment on that this curriculum, this educational experience has the capacity and the power to transform people in the way they think and in the way they interact in every context of their lives. And I have found that to be true both as a, um, as a student many, many years ago and as a professor. It so changed my life that I closed my law practice at the end of my, when I received my first degree and decided that this was something that I wanted to do and be involved in. At first I thought I would become just a mediator, full-time mediator. I went through the program with my older brother who that's the track he took and he became a very prolific uh, mediator. Uh, before he passed away in 2017. Actually, I think the count was he had, had mediated over 10,000 cases in the years that he spent doing that. My uh, journey took me in a different direction. Immediately after finishing my program, I worked as a consultant to inner city schools, not just inner city schools, but school districts and schools across the country in teaching these principles as part of a curriculum, a K through 12 curriculum, that would ultimately be presented to students as part of a gang violence prevention you know, program. And one of the most rewarding things um, that I did. And, and then I, uh, I went on to the faculty at Pepperdine uh, Law School and I directed a special education advocacy clinic for 15 years where we went and we taught uh, and, and trained school districts and parents on how to resolve conflict involving the education of children with disabilities. In 2017, I thought I was going to retire because I had well, I now have 19 grandkids and I thought I would be visiting grandkids, but being away from uh, teaching, even for a few months, made me extremely anxious. And so I came back and I've been at USC for over five years as director of the Center for Dispute Resolution. It's in my blood. It would be in anyone's blood, I think, uh, getting involved with it. And it's great to see students who become so enthusiastic and so transformed by this experience. And so the first thing uh, to think about is, well, why is that? You know, what is it about dispute resolution education that is tr so transforming? Here at uh, Gould Center for Dispute Resolution, we have a very diverse student body. And by that, I mean, not only culturally, um, we have students from over 40 different countries speaking more than 40 different languages, but we also have people that are not lawyers. This is a great program for non-lawyers as well as lawyers. In fact, when I first applied, being a lawyer was a disadvantage 
because the program really was looking to uh, transform people in other uh, business and professional and uh, uh, career contexts. Being a lawyer, I found that I had to unlearn a lot of bad habits. Um, and so I often referred to myself as a recovering lawyer, a recovering legal gladiator, if you will, um, because there were certain things that are done differently. I find that in uh, the students, not only do we have students from diverse cultures and so forth, but also from diverse experience. For example, we have judges, appellate justices, attorneys from major law firms with many, many years of experience uh, with national and international firms, independent lawyers. We have owners of businesses, um, CEOs, CFOs, um, many, many HR folks. Anybody that's in human resources knows that it's fraught with conflict. And so we have people from entertainment, education, the medical field, the dental field, the, uh, any kind of, of situation. In fact, um, one of the things that my wife often told me was that this um, educational experience for me also transformed our family life. No longer when we had discussions and I asked questions did feel members of the family feel like they were being uh, in a deposition, <laughs> whole nother story. So that is kind of the background. And so what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna introduce you to what uh, is the beginning of a negotiation class. And I've kind of tweaked it a little bit because we're not gonna spend a whole class period don't want to bore you all, although in this environment and, and in this context, it is an exciting and interesting um, kind of curriculum where students can be in a class for three hours and then toward the end say, boy, class is already over. And I don't know about you, but there are very few kinds of curriculum I was ever in where after three hours, I... Uh, you know, said, wow, the time period is already uh, already at the end. So we're gonna we're gonna um, go into that. Let me just tell you a story that I often tell my students when we begin our negotiation class. And it's actually a true story about the uh, Teddy Roosevelt and his run, the second run for the presidency of the United States. And it's an interesting story that kind of highlights some of these dynamics about how people negotiate and how people think about problems. Well, Teddy Roosevelt was getting ready for his second campaign, and the campaign printed one million copies of the president's photograph to be distributed during the campaign. There was just one problem. In the haste of getting that project done, they had neglected to get copyright permission from the photographer. So here was a potential and very expensive disaster facing the campaign. And when they looked at their options, they were not good. Their options were number one, they could just forget about it and go distribute the photographs without getting copyright permission. The risk of that was well over a million dollars because at that time, every photograph constituted a violation of the copyright even back then. Uh, and so that was a very expensive risk that they would be taking to just ignore it and go distribute it. The other option that they had was to uh, have them recopied. And back then, copying photographs wasn't like going to Costco or something like that, and just having them done. It was very expensive and it would cost the, them, would have cost them, I believe, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Let's assume that it was over $500,000. So their options were not very good. And so what I would often do, and I will ask you now, 
if you were negotiating with the photographer and you wanted to strike a deal with the photographer, how much would you ha have to pay before you would consider it a good deal, realistically? And in my classes, many times when we think about the power that the photogra uh, photographer would have, the result uh, or the conclusion is, well, if they could pay anything less than their best alternatives, that would be a good deal. In other words, if the, if the best deal was, you know, uh, they'd have to pay $500,000 to reprint, then anything less than $500,000 would be a, 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 not a great deal, but a, a better deal than those risks. And so after we have that discussion, I say, well, here is what the campaign manager actually did. He cabled the photographer with this message. Great opportunity for a photographer. And by the way, this is a true story. If I didn't say so before. Great opportunity for a photographer. We plan to use 1 million copies of the president's photograph in our campaign. How much would you pay us to use your photograph? Think about that for a minute. How much would you pay for us to use your photograph? And immediately the photographer wired back saying, thank you, thank you for this great opportunity. Unfortunately, I can only afford a couple hundred dollars. And then I tell students the purpose of this class is to have you think of that kind of a solution automatically. See, the problem in negotiation is too often we only think of our situation and we fail to consider the situation as it relates to the other party. Well, if you think about it, the photographer's options weren't very good either. If the, if the campaign decided not to use the photographer's photograph, the photographer benefited nothing from that arrangement, nothing. Those million photographs could sit on the side and would provide the, photograph, uh, the photographer with nothing. On the other hand, if the photo photographs were used with his name or her name, I think it was his name at the time associated with it, think of the publicity that photographer would have with respect to his business, which is exactly how the photographer processed that information. And so what we do is we teach students that when we're looking at a negotiation situation, we have to look at it in terms of not only our own situation, but also the situation of the other party or parties. Now I'm gonna share my screen and take you through some of the kind of initial slides of this course. And I will try to get to this quickly. So let's talk about conflict for a minute. Uh, and now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to see all of your pictures because we have a large large group. So if you have a question, hold it. We will have a question and answer period. Uh, 
But if there's something that you just want to say beforehand, I'm not going to do the raise your hands. You can just unmute and chime in, just as if we were in uh, a classroom uh, uh, together. So let's talk about conflict and interdependence. Conflict is a potential consequence of interdependence. Conflict arises from strongly divergent needs of two or more parties, from misperceptions and misunderstandings. And when two people are working toward the same goal and generally want the same outcome, but maybe have different ways of getting there, or both parties want very different outcomes. I mean, there are a lot of different kinds of conflict. And conflict results from the interaction of interdependent people. When I say interdependent, you know, if there's a conflict over something, usually a conflict occurs when we want something that someone else has the power to interfere with our getting. You know, and 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 sometimes both parties want something and they each stand in the way of each other accomplishing their goal. That means there's some interdependence. Now, of course, that interdependence is not often equal. One party may be more powerful or have greater leverage than the other. But many ways to define conflict. We think about it as a sharp disagreement or opposition of, of interest. And usually think about this, when people think of conflict, usually negative terms come to our mind. I will often ask students, what comes to your mind initially when you think of conflict? And they'll think of disputes, uh, war, fighting, ang you know, all of these various um, aspects um, of negativity. And yet conflict is not in and of itself inherently good or bad. And that's one foundational principle to understand that while conflict is a disagreement between two or more people or groups, it is not inherently good or bad. It's merely a fact of life. And it's how we react to conflict that makes it positive or negative. Think about that for a minute. The worst thing that a big company can have, a big corporation can have, is people sitting around a board room as members of a board of directors and just saying yes to the president uh, uh, or the CEO or whoever else is perceived to be the leader. In that situation, growth does not happen. Success is often stagnant and development often lags. So we understand that conflict in and of itself, and yet people have different approaches to conflict and some of them can be very, very dysfunctional. Um, this is a dual concerns model that is used just in, in every kind of curriculum associated with um, dispute resolution. But think about it for a minute. You might even consider as you're thinking about it, where do you fall upon this, um, uh, upon this scale? Well, first we have people that, um, let me see if I can get some of this out of the way here so I can see this. We have some people that yield, you know, yielding is where someone has concern about others' outcomes. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes it can be self-defeating. Uh, when we think of lose-win, if someone always gives in and yields to the other, and I'm not talking about avoiding, I'm talking about yielding, the productive or positive aspect of this is usually seen in a parent or like in my case, a grandparent 
I think of my own granddaughter, you know, and here in this picture, you see what? Half of a cupcake or whatever. And let's say that I want it and my granddaughter wants it. True story from dinner yesterday. Um, similar, but it was a cookie. Um, I'm, unless I'm a monster, going to yield to my granddaughter because my concern in that context is greater for her outcome than my outcome. Parents often yield their interest um, to the interest of their children or grandparents to their grandchildren. On the other side, we have contending. Those are people that are concerned about their own outcomes. These are very competitive folks um, that always seem to want to win or get their way. I think of a group of people that work together going to lunch and uh, you have a situation where maybe one in the party always has an opinion and always wants to get their way. We're gonna go to this place, we're gonna go to that place. And while that may seem like an insignificant idea it can be grinding on people. Maybe you think of an experience where you have people that always need to win. I remember a story of a president of a major Fortune 500 company who flew in private jets, and he was playing a board game of some kind with someone. And uh, when they were flying into their destination, the pilot was asked to circle, I don't know, for an hour before they landed because this CEO insisted on playing this game until he won. So contending, people's concern about their own outcomes. And you get this with uh, many folks that don't consider that when they grind out a deal and always need to get their way on something, oftentimes, um, it can backfire on them. I think of an experience years ago where I had a partner and we were building some spec homes in Orange County, California. And he ground, he, he was a great negotiator and we're building four spec houses and he ground and he ground this contractor on things to where finally the contractor agreed to the terms, but was not happy. And what we found out was that as time went on, the contractor was making up what he felt was an unfair deal by taking materials from our job site to another job site. And so even though in this context, uh, my partner was thought he was winning by contending and only being concerned about uh, our outcome, um, it really was not a good deal. And of course, what we usually think about um, in some situations is avoiding. Um, some people are so anxious and desirous to avoid conflict that they will avoid um, engaging. That's different than yielding. Avoiding is a situation where someone will not engage, will not speak up, will not stand up, and yet they're not yielding out of concern about the other's outcome. They're simply avoiding because they don't like conflict. And in those situations, I say lose, lose, because people then on both sides the person getting their way and the person avoiding lose out on opportunities to create value and create deals that would be better for both of them. Sometimes in avoiding conflict, it continues to percolate in the mind of the person avoiding. They might cut off any contact uh, with a relative or a friend avoid them as well as the conflict and destroy relationships. You've heard of people that 
stop contacting or having contact with people and maybe a family member, maybe a parent or a child or uh, some other close friend for many, many years. Well, when we think of doing the right thing, and I hear this often in compromise, uh, in, uh, in resolving conflict through compromise, this is kind of society's fallback. You know, we, we as a mediator and as someone that uh, worked with families in school districts and in disputes involving children with disabilities, I would often uh, go to mediations or uh, go to uh, negotiations and have someone say, look, we all need to compromise. We all need to, to give in. We need to be a little unhappy and maybe a little happy. I used to find this very uh, troubling in special education matters. And I felt like compromising was not productive and not ideal. And uh, administrative law judges would often be the mediators in uh, these kinds of cases and would come in and give a little speech to parents saying, you know, we've come here, I know you want this or you want that, or the school district's only willing to give this or that. But, you know, we really need to compromise. We need to kind of meet halfway. Well, I thought about that and I thought, you know, that often didn't work. Why didn't it work? Well, think about it. What parent would be willing to compromise the well-being of their child? For example, assume that your child has a childhood cancer and you go to the oncologist. What is the question that you have for the doctor, the, the team of doctors? It's usually, what does my child need to live? What does my child need to live? Well, let's suppose that the oncologist says, there are four things, A, B, C, and D. Your child needs those four things to live. So you go to the insurance company and they say, whoa, that's a lot of money. Why don't we uh, compromise? Let's meet halfway. We'll do A and B, but not C and D. The outcome, the child's health. Now, a parent is probably not going to say, oh, we'll meet you halfway. They want whatever it takes. So in the special education setting, if you can think about this, I would often say, don't ask a parent to compromise the well-being of a child. Well, you can think, well, that, that's rather unrealistic because some parents are overly demanding. And uh, I said, well, you need to change the equation and ask why. Let's give an example of a parent who's saying, I want my child uh, and my demand is that they have one-on-one -on -one speech therapy five times a week for two hours a day. And the school district saying, let's compromise. Let's do three times a week for 20 minutes. Well, if it's framed in that way, the parent is thinking, my child's welfare will suffer if I don't get my way. Compromising means compromising means um, giving in and, and jeopardizing the well-being of my child. So really, how do we deal with not compromising? And that is in problem solving. And I'll use that example in this next slide. I've been telling the story since my Megan and Meredith uh, were about 12 years old, 12 or 13 years old. I'm now here in Arizona with uh, Megan, who is 
38 and has children of her own. That's how long I've been using this example. But let's assume that Megan and Meredith at age 12 um, and 13 want an orange. And some of you, if you've had exposure to dispute resolution education, may have uh, come across this example. It's very demonstrative. And I use the example that they run down to the refrigerator. They both have an equal right to one orange and they both want it. And they come to me, Solomon, to solve this dispute. How do we resolve the dispute where each daughter has an equal right to an orange? They both want it. What we would do, and I would ask students generally, we would cut it in half and we would give each of the children half of the orange. The, the problem solving way, however, is not to assume a fixed high. Problem solving goes beyond compromise. Dividing the orange is compromise. We would go to problem solving. The magic question is, I know your positions are, I want the orange, but I ask why? Why? What are your interests? The positions of each of the daughters, I want the orange. And we were ordinarily cut it in half. But when I ask why, Meredith says, I'm making a cake. I need the peel for zest for frosting. Megan's just hungry. She wants the fruit. Now, by asking why, by finding out the interest that they each have, we have created value. Think about that. Each of the daughters in problem solving get 100% of what they want. They may have an interdependence in terms of the orange as a position, but by looking at why their underlying interest, we can come up with a solution that creates value. Now I will tell you, for those who have not gone through dispute resolution education, and I find this with judges and lawyers all the time, who have engaged in negotiations over many, many years. They never discover this secret because there is no feedback. Usually after negotiation, people go their way and things that were not said or revealed are never found out. And so just like with Teddy Roosevelt, we think, what is the negotiation situation? What is the interdependence? How can we do this um, better? Let's see if I can advance this. So let's talk about this. Creating value and claiming value. The negotiator's dilemma. Now it's easy to look at the orange things don't always present themselves that clearly. Although I will tell you, I have multiple simulations and in dispute resolution education, you don't just have a lecture like we're having today. There are simulations where people engage in activities that take the theory and then build skills using them so that when you have a class, it's great to read about these things, but to actually do them and apply them in your life takes practice. And the important aspect of that is that when you combine practice with theory, you develop skills that ultimately have the potential to become part of who you are in every context 
of your life. So how does this become complex? Well, here's the problem. We want to create value. And most of the time, cooperating will help us create value. But we also do not want to be exploited. So cooperating may leave you open to being exploited. So we have the dilemma of honesty. How much truth to tell the other? Tell them everything, tell them nothing. The dilemma of trust. How much do you believe the other? Believe everything, believe nothing. Well, here's an activity that we do, and I will do this quickly um, so that you can think about how this plays out in really kind of creating a dilemma that you have to work through. And some of you may have been exposed to the prisoner's dilemma. It's simply this. When I do this, there's a couple of rules that you need to uh, abide by. And that is accept the circumstances as I, as I give them to you. Even though um, you might say, I would never do that, or I would never act in this way or that way. Assume that you are. Now, here in the prisoner's dilemma, you have been arrested with a co-criminal, okay? Now, again, right off the bat, you're thinking, I've never been arrested. I don't plan to ever be arrested, particularly for a heinous crime or for a crime that would carry a life sentence. Humor me. You've done this. And it's important that you make this assumption for this activity. You have committed a crime with someone that you do not really know well. You have no basis to either trust or distrust this person, okay? Now the given is you've done it. And you're gonna have to make a decision. You have each been separated into separate cells. And the prosecutor is going to come and meet with you. The consequences of your actions depend not only upon what you do and say, but also upon what the other person does and says. Here's the rules. You cannot communicate with the other party. You have no basis in a relationship upon which to either uh, trust or not trust this person. When I would do this in uh, as, as part of gang violence prevention, um, there was always this rule, under undergirding rule of no one's ever a snitch. And I have to say, you have to put that culture aside and the decision you're gonna make in this activity is solely based upon what you believe will be in your best interest, your best outcome. Not what you morally think would be the right thing to do. Now, again, when I do this with social workers, teachers, they struggle. They just can't bring themselves to do that. But Humor me for purposes of this activity. You're going to make a decision based solely upon what is in your best interest in terms of doing the least amount of time. Now, the prosecutor is going to meet with you and with the other party, and you are going to have two choices. Either sit tight and say nothing or defect and confess. Those are your two options. If you both sit tight, if you look at this column, other person sits tight, I sit tight, the most time that you can do would be two years. Okay? On the other hand, 
if the other person sits tight and you defect, you confess, the other person sits tight, you go free. And the other person gets a life sentence. Okay? So sitting tight, you both sit tight. The most you can do is two years each. However, if one sits tight and the other defects, the person who sits tight will get life if the other person confesses. So here's the other person. The other person confesses and you sit tight, you get that life sentence. However, if you both confess, if you both confess, you both get 20 years. So right now, decide what you will do. Are you going to sit tight or are you going to confess? If you have a piece of paper, write it down. And then I would ask students, did you sit tight or did you confess? Now, I can't see all of you, but think for a moment, how many sat tight? Hit your hand button if you can, and we'll just get a, another idea of how many sat tight. And for those of you that may have sat tight, unmute and tell me why you sat tight. Anyone? Emmanuel, can you tell me why? Yes, I said I sat tight, hoping that the other person also will, will do the same. Okay. So both of us will have lesser sentence. Okay. Now that's a great example, and I could, you know, if uh, we're going to be running short on time, but usually when I ask this question, I might have half the room sitting tight and half of the people confessing. And when I asked why, it's usually I hoping against hope that the other person will do the same thing. And you might ask yourself, what makes one group of people sit uh, tight and, 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 and not defect and others defect so readily. Now, again, in my situation, you have no basis to trust the other person. So you don't have any experience. You're hoping that the other person will sit tight. Now, I find generally that group, the, that group of people that sit tight have a basic trust in people. In other words, they choose to believe that mankind, society generally, people are trustworthy and you can trust them. On the other hand, there's a group of people that say, I, I don't have uh, any way to, to uh, project or to predict if a person is going to or not. I'm therefore, if you think about my other uh, slide here, I have the risk of being exploited. Cooperating is sitting tight. Contending is taking control and confessing. So when you think about it, if a person's life experience has been such that they have been exploited, that they have um, been hurt, betrayed by friends or a spouse or a partner, they may be 
inherently less trustful and more inclined to uh, look out for themselves. Because again, think about it. Once you sit tight, it, everything depends on the other person. They have control. Now, from a game theory, you would always defect. If you were just to do it on a mathematical calculation, you would never sit tight. If you're only looking at why, let's take a look. If I defect and the other person sits tight, I go free. What's better, going free? or 20 years because if you defect and the other person defects the worst you can do is 20 years if you defect and the other person doesn't you go free well 20 years is better than a life sentence going free is you know everything's better than or, or going free is better than two years you can never do worse if you if you uh, confess. That's just game theory. You're better off no matter what the other person does. Dependence. There's a conflict. There is a negotiator's dilemma. Trust everything. Trust nothing. Um, and, and usually when I do the prisoner's dilemma and someone has decided that they would sit tight and the other person defects and they get life, I'll repeat it and say, well, let's just assume that the governor has commuted your sentence, you're out, and as unlikely as it seems, you're in the same predicament again with a different person. Are you now going to still sit tight or defect? And many times, you know, it's the idea, fool me once, you know, okay, but not again. So, um, so I, I want to stop now to give you opportunities um, to ask questions. I haven't monitored the chat, but we will... Um, we will do that, and I'm hoping that I have my support still here because I can't chew gum and walk at the same time. Um, so if you have uh, any, um, any questions, let me answer them. And, and I will just repeat this again. I hope you can see the transformative power of this kind of educational experience. And, you know, people do it for a number of reasons. Um, the great thing about this education is, you know, if you go to dental school, you become a dentist. If you go to medical school, become a doctor. You go to law school to become a lawyer. You go to electrical school or engineering school. This is an added on skill that can be applied in any area um, and, and, and it truly is transformative. It makes life more worth living. It gives every person an opportunity to change the world in the sense that they, in the context in which they live and, and exist. So your questions and um, what questions do you have? And feel free to just unmute and speak up if you want, or you can type it in the chat and we can do it that way as well. Hello, good morning, sir. Are you able to hear me? My name is I Tina am. Palmer. Hello. 
I would like to just say thank you for an absolutely delightful lecture. I've already learned so much. It was so wonderful. Um, I do have a question. Um, I don't know if you mentioned it, but um, is there any way that we can get a copy of this? Um, yes, of this there, lecture there that you certainly gave today? is. Um, and, you know, here at USC, let me just say this. You've met Amanda. And if any of you have been talking to our admissions folks, uh, Ashley Sim, we have the greatest support here um, at USC. I'm so grateful to work with Amanda and with Ashley and with others in our graduate international programs. And you will find that our professors are, are some of the best in their fields and they do this and I do this because we really care about our students. We care about this and are passionate about this, um, this area of education and are anxious for it to be part of everyone's lives. So yes, it will be available. Amanda, can you tell folks how they will be able to access this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it should be distributed to attendees via email. Um, it probably won't be today, but um, but there will be a link there. Um, and then Professor Peterson, there's also another question in the chat for you of what's the difference between an arbitrator and a mediator? And oh, does someone a... have to go through extra measures to become one or the other? Great question. And you know, it's interesting because I get that question from lawyers and non-lawyers as well. Mediators are trained to facilitate negotiation. They are not decision makers. When I mediate cases, I don't have power to render a binding decision or even a non-binding decision on uh, parties that are participating. The skills that I use are those that help people process and evaluate information and make decisions for themselves. Some of the underlying principles are um, self-determination. Um, there, If I'm a, a mediator, I'm there as someone to help parties reach an agreement to help people think through the consequences of their decisions, to help people process information in a way where they can create value, as we've talked about um, uh, before. And uh, there are a lot of people that are lawyers that are not happy being lawyers after many years, and they think, well, I'm just going to change the sign in my door instead of saying attorney at law, I'm going to say mediator open for business. And there are some that are very successful, but I will say that being a mediator is not just being a lawyer. In fact, some of the best mediators I know are not lawyers. So it's a facilitative thing. You use skills and we have skills in courses associated with mediation, with negotiation, that help people help others. An arbitrator, on the other hand, is an adjudicator. It is someone that is being retained to evaluate evidence and make a decision, which may be binding or not binding on the parties. Arbitration is usually a consequence of a contract where parties agree that in the event there is a conflict or dispute arising from the contract, that they will not go to court, but rather they will submit the dispute to arbitration before an arbitrator or in some cases, a panel of arbitrators. If you own a cell phone, you have agreed that if you ever get into a dispute with your cell phone operate, uh, company, 
you will settle the dispute by arbitration, not by going to court. Um, and sometimes those agreements can be abused where it takes away a party's right to go to court. And that has been litigated, uh, you know, all the way up to the US Supreme Court. And, um, and even though you don't have a choice, you either agree to your AT&T contract or your T-Mobile contract, or you don't get their phone. Same thing if you go to a doctor or you go to a dentist or some other professional, you will likely have an arbitration clause in your contract. Same with employment. They're everywhere. They can be good and they can be exploitive. Um, for example, who picks the arbitrator? Um, so that's a, a whole nother story for another day. And there's a lot of um, controversy over whether or not those are fair or not fair. Arbitration is adjudicatory. It's very close to litigation on the continuum. Mediation is voluntary. It's confidential. And the parties retain the power whether or not to agree or not to agree. Um, so we have we have another question. We have several questions in the comments, but a couple that have come um, just to me. So I want to make sure that they're read in, in the order they were sent. And so one was, would you be able to talk about the benefits of a degree in MDR in the context of lawyering and practicing law? Absolutely. And by the way, I'm just typing my, my email if anybody has additional questions you think about. That's an excellent question. And I will tell you, I was a full-time practicing trial attorney when I went and, um, and got this degree. And if you think about it as a, as a lawyer, particularly one that deals with conflict or trials, you spend... 95 to 98% of your time outside of trial for your cases. You're going to be negotiating, mediating, and trying to resolve conflict more in the context of what we teach versus trial skills. And trial skills are important. And, you know, let me give you an example. I have judges and appellate court justices that enroll in our program. And when I, when, that, when I first got involved and had those kinds of students, I thought, this is a little intimidating. I've got a judge that's been on the bench for 40 years. And is this judge or justice going to think, who are you to teach me? I mean, I've been a judge for 40 years. I've seen it all. And it never ceases to amaze me the humility that exists from those that want to learn because what we're teaching is something that was generally not taught in law school. Um, many, many law schools um, more and more have this curriculum but many do not. When I went to law school, ahead, we didn't have any of this. I mean, we were taught to be legal gladiators, never feel sorry for the other side. You know, you go into battle and don't feel sorry for the other side. So it was for me as a lawyer, it was the most important aspect of my legal training. And I kept saying to myself, I wish I would have known this 20 years earlier. So excellent question. So the next one, I'm just happy to read them so we don't have to worry about tracking. Uh, but have any US presidents been trained mediators? 
Well, interesting. I think they have. I'm not sure currently. Abraham Lincoln, you know, mediation, what mediation's been around since the written history has been taken in some form or another. But, you know, it's interesting. Abraham Lincoln, you know, made several statements and and one that he counsel that he gave for lawyers is settle. You know, find ways to resolve conflict. There's enough cases, enough money to be made, but you will do better for your clients if you find a way to resolve it. Now, I will say when mediation in terms of the litigated case started evolving, um, I was part of a focus group when I first started practicing law in 79 or 80. A retired judge held a focus group and talked about this idea that he had to create a company that would promote mediation and other forms of alternative dispute resolution. His name was Warren Knight. He, his business that he created is called JAMS, Judicial Arbitration and Mediation Service. It's the largest in the world. Um, so the, the problem is when I first was introduced to mediation, it was held more like a settlement conference. For those of you that may be lawyers, in litigated cases, judges hold what's called settlement conferences. They'll bring both sides together. They'll have each side argue their case. And then the judge or settlement officer um, will then try to get the parties to settle. That's not mediation. And usually in settlement conferences, at least early on, a judge was more concerned, and not all judges, but I'm just saying the purpose of this was to lighten the load of cases on the docket. In the 1980s, when I was a trial lawyer, the docket, the filings in court were so numerous that it took over five years to get to trial from the time you filed a case, over five years. And so settlement conferences came about where the judge would often push people to settle, not concerned about interest of, of the party. I mean, some judges were very empathetic, but generally speaking, the person that got pushed the most was the weakest link. Um, and, and, and so for many lawyers, mediation in their minds was or is a type of settlement conference where parties come before you and the lawyer hears each side, decides who's right or wrong, and then tries to pressure the people to settle. That's not mediation. Mediation uses skills to help people process information, to see how this interdependence can uh, be used by each party to develop an interest-based solution that is more satisfactory to both sides. Now, again, we have whole courses on mediation, both in mediation generally, mediation in the context of being a mediator or being a certain kind of mediator, for example, employment dispute mediation, divorce and family mediation, education, special education mediation. And so um, I will tell you I, um, our program, our master's program for students that go full-time, they may start in the fall and graduate in the spring. And I, I see them transformed. They'll come in. Some have just got a bachelor's degree and have no real significant life experience. On the other hand, some, like I said, have been judges on the bench for many years and everything in between. And we go through this process where they're introduced, they're taught and introduced to these skills and then put them into practice. And 
toward the end of their program, we have a, a mediation clinic where students, I take students into the courts, small claims and civil harassment, and they are able to use those skills and mediate real cases with real people with real disputes. It is addictive, transformative. Uh, I've won jury trials involving seven figures before. I've, I've had arbitrations, trials, and I've had the highs of being a victor, and the lows of, of losing. I've never found more satisfaction in helping people find a solution that meets their interest, where value is created and there's more satisfaction. Um, studies have shown that people are more satisfied with outcomes in mediation than they are in uh, litigation. And I saw a question, I hope that answers your question. I'm gonna go back up to the chat that I saw. Um, do you consider the skill of mediation a leadership skill? Absolutely, absolutely. I can't emphasize that enough. Even if a person is not going to be an official mediator, mediation skills are used in every context of your life. For example, I have many HR people. They're not going to be formal mediators, but they are going to be involved in resolving conflict between other employees. Now, one thing I find about HR folks, and if you are one, you can probably relate to this, as well as judges and attorneys. Judges, attorneys, CEOs, leaders, supervisors, what are you used to doing? You're used to listening, getting a grasp on the issue, and, and coming to um, a solution. There's one difference when you're using mediation skills. A judge can say, hear both sides and say, you're an idiot, and you're right, you're wrong, or this is what you should do, do this, do that. That's not mediation. Now there is a type of mediation which is called evaluative and in employment context, many lawyers will hire mediators to give opinions and tell people who's right or wrong. But even in those contexts, the way you do it becomes important. That's where mediation training and dispute resolution training comes in. I, I say it like this. You can tell someone to go to hell. Being a mediator is being able to tell someone to go to hell in a way that they look forward to the trip. You know, it's, it's being able to help people find. For example, when I'm introducing people to mediation and they do their first simulation, They'll start the mediation by listening to the parties and immediately say, well, I think this is what you should do, or I think that's what you should do. One of the important aspects of being a mediator is establishing trust and rapport. It takes patience. So for a judge, I'm saying you're used to determining who's right or wrong and telling them. But now that you've taken the judge robes off, and you're working as a mediator, the second you hear people in the first few minutes and tell someone who's right or wrong, because it's not binding, because you do not have power to force your decision, in those few moments, people decide the judge is against me or this mediator is against me. The mediator doesn't get it. They don't understand the facts. And you're more likely during that process to have an impasse where the parties can't reach an agreement. 
On the other hand, I tell prospective mediators, the most important thing you can do is establish trust and rapport with the parties. Let them know, and even in our mediations are often or almost all on Zoom now, I establish trust and rapport. I want the parties to know that I am sincerely interested in helping them each attain their goals. Well, you can say, how can you do that and not be biased? And this may sound counterintuitive. I'm biased in favor of both parties. In other words, I'm not putting my finger on the scale. I'm not advising them to do things at the expense of the other. I'm simply helping them process information in a way that they can each accomplish their goals. Much of the work I do in mediation is done in caucus, in private me uh, meetings. Now, if you think about this, mediations are confidential, meaning whatever is said to me is confidential. I can't reveal it to the other side, nor can I be compelled, except under very rare circumstances, to testify in court or to tell a judge or someone else what a party has said. Mediation has rules intended to make it successful and meaningful and satisfactory to the side, both sides in confidentiality, where people can feel safe to reveal information they would not otherwise reveal in the, in the, um, in the course of uh, resolving a conflict, either by, by litigation or others. So think about that for a minute. As a mediator, when I'm mediating with people and meet with them in caucus confidentially, if I have established trust and rapport, if people honestly understand that I'm there to help them find solutions, I will be the holder of information that no one else will know, not even their own attorneys. I will have information from both parties. And with that information, I can help find, help the parties find solutions that would meet both of their interests without compromising or being biased or favoring one side or the other. It is one of the most rewarding and satisfying experiences I've ever had. I, when I went through this program the first time, I had been practicing law for 20 years. I had a very successful trial practice. I made a lot of money. I went and told my secretary, I'm closing the practice. You're what? I am not doing this anymore. What are you going to do? I don't know. I'm going to make this my life. What did I do? The first thing I, I, I did, I took a course on dispute resolution and education. I said, I'm going to get involved in education. I went to uh, Colorado State, got a certificate in developing curriculum for K through 12 education. And I got a job with a curriculum company teaching uh, to train educators, teachers, administrators, probation officers this stuff. I went from making lots of money to $500 a day going across the country. I was in the Bronx and Harlem. I was at Columbine in Colorado just a couple months after that tragedy, that school shooting. I did in-service in Compton Unified for a, a year. Um, and, and not just inner city schools, but Columbine was not an inner city school. It applied in some of the, of the uh, school shootings involve um, 
very high eco economic uh, environments and 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 uh, uh, cultural settings. It's applicable everywhere. The high you get in doing this, and what's great, I had this experience many years where owner of a business, he says, I own four or five businesses. I'm going nuts with conflict. One of our graduates, I, I can't remember ever someone saying, gee, I really regret getting this degree or this certificate or whatever. As a lawyer, it's invaluable. It's invaluable no matter what environment. And what's great for those just starting out and they're saying, what should I do? What are you passionate about? I had a young woman from uh, Singapore uh, came. She was concerned. She said, I've lived in multiple Asian countries. I speak two or three languages. But I'm in my 20s. How can I compete with a retired judge at Jams, some of these mediators, and I said, don't, you don't need to. I said, listen, if a family is in conflict and they came from Singapore, they came from another country where you have lived, you speak the language, and they've got a domestic dispute, do you think they would rather have a mediator that looks and talks like me or someone like you? that knows their culture, knows the language. And she has gone on to be very, very successful. That's why I love it so much is where is your passion? And when I consult with students, and I know some programs want to be um, um, truth in advertising or whatever, so they can be very discouraging to others. The person that we have teaching our divorce and family mediation came from Canada to, uh, to get an education, to get a, a master's degree in dispute resolution, was very discouraged after talking to the director who said, you're young, you, you know, this is going to be very difficult. It's not very realistic that you're going to be able to, to do this until you're older and blah, blah, blah. She was ready to go back to Canada. She said, she went ahead, got her degree, and she started uh, networking through Southern California Mediation Association. In our program, all students are given free membership for the year with Southern California Mediation Association. She started um, networking and working with experienced mediators. She is a prolific and very successful family mediator and it, she didn't have to get gray hair or, or, you know, men lose their hair like I did before they could become successful. It's not always easy because you're, the sky's the limit and you have to work hard. Um, but again, you can do it in any context. I know people that have gone through, they've been uh, 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 educational administrators assistant superintendents, the person that teaches our, our special education dispute resolution course is not a lawyer. I met him almost 20 years ago, sitting across the table for an IEP for triplets with autism. He represented the district. I was working with the parents. The president of the Southern California Mediation Association also teaches a mediation course for us, Dr. Rosenthal has an, a background in education, not a, a lawyer. So whether you're a lawyer or not, in any context, I will tell you it's transformative and beneficial. And you don't have to be a dispute resolution professional on, your, uh, on its own to make this more than worth your while. Okay, I, you know, the, one of the problems with me, I'm, I love this so much that I tend to talk too much. So I apologize. Maybe the questions, uh, answers have gone well beyond what you expected. Anything else? And, and again, I've got my email 
uh, down there. So feel free to contact me anytime. But does anyone else have any questions? Oh, confidentiality. How is it different with court litigation in terms of confidentiality? Very, very good question. Um, different jurisdictions have different confidentiality requirements. Um, generally speaking, it's like whatever is said in mediation stays in mediation. It's kind of like the Las Vegas, whatever happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. There are exceptions to it. Um, if there is a crime, if there's violence, someone's, uh, but the exceptions are very, very rare. Usually what I do as a mediator is have the parties sign a written confidentiality agreement because confidentiality means, generally speaking, that um, information that is revealed in mediation cannot be used in court against the other. In other words, if, if a party goes into mediation and says, look, I'm really sorry, you know, I feel responsible, I'd like to resolve this matter, the person can't, uh, if the case doesn't settle, go into court and say, in mediation, they said they were sorry and it was their fault. Um, rules of evidence preclude that from happening. But confidentiality can mean more than that. Uh, parties can bind themselves not to talk about it outside of mediation. Now, in some, if there isn't a written agreement in some jurisdictions, the confidentiality goes as far as not being able to use it in litigation or against the other parties, but unless the parties agree to further confidentiality provisions, a party could go out on the steps of the office building and hold a news conference and talk and talk about it. So confidentiality can mean different things. Generally speaking, when we mediate in our clinic, in small claims court, we present each side with a rather comprehensive confidentiality agreement where people agree not to talk about it. Everything said in mediation won't be revealed to third parties, et cetera. That's the safest way to do it. And, um, and again, mediators are generally protected from being compelled to testify. And one of the reasons that is so is that we want parties to have confidence in mediation. We want them to have confidence that if they reveal something to a mediator, that that information cannot be compelled in court. So the courts have been very strict in interpreting that so that parties can feel free to reveal things to a mediator that they would otherwise not reveal to a, another third party. Any other questions? Are there certifying bodies for ADR to make it? That's an excellent question as well. Generally speaking, there is not. Um, um, and I'm going to qualify that. Um, a person could uh, put up a put up a sign and say, you know, Richard Peterson mediator without any training or experience. Um, so generally speaking, there isn't. However, mediating in certain um, environments, for example, in the courts, or there are organizations that sponsor mediation where there has to be a certain level of training. In California, we have a, uh, a, a certain threshold mediation training. Um, and before our students are able to go into the courts and mediate, they have to satisfy those statutory requirements, which is usually 20 or 40 hours of training and so forth. We do have in Southern California Mediation Association has uh, uh, not officially, but another organization that partners with that. 
MC3, I think it's called, that is working on setting standards for mediation cert certification. So most certifications are voluntary. And uh, many times people that are hiring mediators will not hire a mediator unless they have had that training. So some people can go just to, you know, a, a, a week long or 40 hour training and get mediation training. That's better than no training at all. But having a certificate, two certificates, an MDR and an LLM, and having taught for 20 years, I believe there's no substitute for the formal education that you will get. And a lot of times we will have students that will start out with a certificate, that's 12 units, and then say, man, I, I want more. So they will then um, go on from the certificate to get their master's. The only difference between an MDR and an LLM is it's the same curriculum. An LLM is for someone that already has a law degree, either domestically in the United States or in another country. And an MDR is for someone with a non-legal degree. They have an undergraduate um, degree of some kind and a certificate would apply to both. The certificate is 12 units, the master's program is 24 units. But excellent question on certifying bodies. I had a student from Australia that went back and, and the, where he lived, um, there was a certification process and we were able to send him documentation to support his compliance with all of those requirements. Any, anyone else? And again, if you, if you think of questions, let me go down. If you're interested in working with an organization like JAMS, we would encourage you to reach out, to, okay. Yeah, and, and again, you know, working with an organization, the best way, if you want to be a dispute resolution professional, choose your passion. What are you passionate about? What is your area of expertise? Because I will tell you, a lot of judges, retired judges and mediators at JAMS don't have um, specific information, for example, in special education. Um and people who have been teachers or who know the uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, who know how to meet the needs of kids with disabilities, in my mind, would be vet better mediators than a retired judge. People who are in construction, who know construction, who know the practicalities of it. Um, entertainment, the same thing, HR folks, people in certain kinds of, of businesses or uh, professions um, do much better. Um, we also have had students that have, as I, I believe Amanda may have said, I have a former student who um, is a, an arbitration assistant to Richard Chernick, a senior vice president at JAMS. So we have people that have had an opportunity to work there's also a career called ombuds. I will tell you as a dream career, this would, uh, would you like to have a career where you help people solve their problems and resolve conflict and there's no paperwork? That's an ombuds. An ombuds it empowers people um, and they're in educational. Every uh, uh, California university uh, under the state of California by statute has an ombuds. They're in colleges, universities, in the medical field, Fortune 500 companies. Um, we have a course in ombuds um, as well. 
So there are lots of career opportunities. But again, I will say the beautiful thing is it fits everywhere. The challenging part is it's a lot of work. And we even have um, panels and, and uh, presentations on creating you know, a mediation practice and so forth. Let me see if there are any other in the chat. I've never practiced law. I have a law, I'm a law graduate. I've worked with government of my state 15 years. Yes, I mean that that is perfect. Um, you know, you know, people that have a law degree um, know how to analyze legal issues and so forth. Um, but you you don't have to be a practicing lawyer. In some cases, you know, having been trained as a trial lawyer, I thought in a different way. I'll just give you a brief example. Questioning. As a trial lawyer, I would take depositions of prospective witnesses. In those depositions, I was not trying to create trust and rapport. I was trying to get information that supported my case. My questioning sometimes would be very direct and maybe adversarial because I wanted information. I didn't want information. I, I'm an advocate for one party. I'm not trying to, to evaluate um, uh, my questions in terms of, of fairness. And again, each side is doing the same. And as an advocate for someone, you're thinking differently. As a mediator, I employ, and this is a term that I created, enthusiastic curiosity. Have you ever had a conversation with someone where they were truly interested in what you had to say? People that are really have good people skills can sit down and talk, not say hardly a word, and a person comes away thinking, that is, I like that person. Why? Because they were sincerely interested in what I had to say. They wanted to know. They weren't listening, looking off to the other side or looking to their watch. A good mediator has enthusiastic curiosity. The questions they ask are not like an attorney in a deposition. They're asked so that they can better understand the needs and interests and wants and fears of a party so they can help them. And again, you know, if you're an HR person or you're a leader, a supervisor, you get more from people you lead when they understand you care about them, about their problems. And that doesn't mean that you're biased in favor of one or the other. And I will say this about bias. You're human. When I hear cases, sometimes I'm mad at one party or the other. I might think in my mind, you're a jerk, you know, and you're a victim. But I can control that bias. If I can't, I need to withdraw. And just because one person's a jerk and the other isn't doesn't mean I can't mediate that case. I might need to try to help that person not be such a jerk. Think differently. That's the beauty of these skills. And I will tell you, I've just celebrated my 48th wedding anniversary. When I started in this education, I was at, I think, 20. If you would have asked my wife then, how is 20 years marriage? She would have said, it's been the best 50 years of my life. In other words, living with me was very difficult. Her answer would be different now. I'm easier to live with. And I, again, I will blame it 
a lot on my training and career. It used to not be uncommon for one of my kids to say, Dad, I'm not on trial. You know, uh, need I say more? So, um, so yes, having a law degree can be beneficial. Not absolutely necessary, but practicing law, definitely not necessary. Again, you develop, and we, we talk about this in, in our courses, developing a reputation. A reputation stays with you, many different kinds of reputations. And a person, I've been a mediator for 35 years. I have lots of matters. People come to me. I have not advertised. Um, uh, and I, I'm sure I could be busier than I am. I don't want to be busy because I'm busy doing this, but I mediate and arbitrate because when I teach, I also do it. I don't just teach theory. I'm a professional and utilize these. And some of the best experience I've ever got is working with parents and school districts that is one of the most contentious areas uh, of life, you know, where people, parents have children with disabilities and school districts have limited resources. And one of the reasons I love doing it was because generally they were great people caught in conflict. They uh, would just prefer not to have. And, if you look at my publications that I've written, my scholarship has been in the area of, of, um, of um, special education and resolving conflict in, in, in those areas. Um, so great, great questions. Um, is the ADR certificate offered online? No. Uh, it, it is not. Um, we have a, a, an MSL program, Masters of Science in Law, which a lot of our HR folks um, take, and we have some dispute resolution courses in that, but our, we do not have it online. We're looking at that. One of the situations uh, is this educational experience is best in person where you interact with people on a personal basis. But online is becoming more and more um, popular. So we do see that in the future. I think some of those are. Actually, I think Amanda has probably answered most of these. Are there any other questions that have not been answered? And again, I invite you to contact me anytime, whether you're interested in our program or not, I'm available. You, you can ask me any questions you want um, about that. I'm happy. Again, I will tell you, to me, what I do in my career is not a job. It's a calling. It's something that gives me satisfaction. And when I started this, uh, more than 20 some odd years ago, I thought to myself, I don't want to be my age, I'm 70 now, looking back and saying, I wish I would have done something different. Um, and, and again, those who have become our students are our students for life. I have students that have contacted and stayed in contact with me from more than 20 years ago. Um, we're, we're interested in your success. We're interested in what you do in your lives. And uh, here at USC, you're a Trojan for life. You're part of our family, you're part of our, our network. Uh, um, and it's been one of the blessings of my life to be associated with the USC Gould School of Law. Anything, uh, anything else? And again, I can't see everybody, so feel free. To, and I'm not sure if Amanda's still 
here may may not be. She may have had another meeting to go to. So if you have another question, feel free to say it. Um, you can send it to me in an email. Just look here. I think that is it. Thank you so much for all of you that uh, stuck around. We went much longer than I intended on keeping you, but um, have a great rest of your week and thank you for joining us.